On the 8th of December 1962, the Indonesian-supported, far-left military group called the North Kalimantan National Army launched a rebellion in the Southeast Asian country of Brunei. The main objective of this insurrection was to capture the Sultan of Brunei and force him to declare the establishment of the United States of North Kalimantan, a pro-Indonesian union encompassing Brunei and the two British-controlled states of Sarawak and North Borneo. Beginning at 0200 on the 8th of December, thousands of rebels began targeting government and police installations, as well as engaging in firefights with the local police forces. The seriousness of the situation forced the Sultan of Brunei to request for British military support, and over the next few days, multiple units began deploying to the country, including the 1st Battalion, the 2nd Gurkha Rifles, the 1st Battalion, the Queen's Own Highlanders, and the Royal Marines of 4-2 Commando, the latter of whom began disembarking in Brunei on the 10th of December. By that day, it was clear that the rebellion was struggling to maintain itself, with an article stating that The rebels had failed to take control of Brunei town, the capital, take control of the person of His Majesty, the Sultan, or defeat the police forces in the capital. More importantly, they have failed to arouse a mass popular uprising in support of their insurrection. Although, for the most part, the rebellion had been contained, there still remained a lot of work to do, particularly with regards to the small rebel groups that spilled over into the neighbouring state of Sarawak. Here, rebels have seized control of the small town of Limbang on the first day of the rebellion, and with it, they had taken a number of hostages, who, intelligence indicated, were to be executed on the morning of the 12th of December 1962. As such, immediate action had to be taken, and on the 11th of December, the Royal Marines of L Company 4-2 Commando were instructed to retake Limbang and free the hostages. Unfortunately for L Company, intelligence on the situation in Limbang was virtually non-existent, with its commanding officer, Captain Jeremy Moore, recalling afterwards. A decision on the best way to set about the task was naturally dependent on information, and this was hard to come by. Maps were scarce and small scale, Limbang was all the millimetre across on the map I had. Another problem was that we did not know where the hostages were. I assessed that the police station seemed the most likely place for the rebel headquarters, and I hoped that if we could knock this out before the enemy commander had time to give orders for the disposal of the hostages, our chances of rescuing them might be increased. Added to the company's problems was the fact that the river, which ran alongside the town, provided the only suitable entry into Limbang, and so the assault plan that was drawn up called for L Company, composed of four, five and six troops, to conduct an amphibious landing in the area of the town's police station, before moving off with all possible speed to secure the hostages. By the evening of the 11th of December 1962, all preparations for the operation were complete, and at 2300, the rescue force, totaling 89 men, loaded up onto two medium-sized landing craft and set off for Limbang. Sailing down the river, the force began entering the town's vicinity at approximately 0600 on the 12th of December, where, as a Royal Marine report documents, as the leading craft rounded the bend, the bizarre area suddenly sprang to life. It was just light at this time, and a large number of rebels were seen running in all directions, but very quickly disappeared into houses and other cover. The police station was immediately recognisable, and the leading craft increased speed and made for the bank at a point about 30 yards upstream of it. The intelligence sergeant, using a loud hailer, announced that the rebellion was over and called upon the insurgents to surrender but they replied by opening heavy fire upon both craft. Through this heavy gun fire, the forward landing craft, carrying the Marines of 5 Troop, made its approach into the designated landing point, during which the first casualties began to be sustained, 
when two Marines, Fred Powell and Gerald Kierens, were sadly killed by enemy fire. Despite the tragic loss of these two Marines, the craft remained on course and eventually made landfall, enabling two sections of five troops to rush ashore and begin the assault on the police station. Meanwhile, the second craft, carrying four and six troops, remained in reserve and provided cover and fire with her two onboard Vickers machine guns, which proved effective in silencing a machine gun post located on the roof of the police station. However, although the weight of this supporting fire was considerable, the assaulting marines of five troop became pinned down on the banks of the river, followed by difficulties being experienced on board the first landing craft, as the report continues. Almost immediately after the leading sections of five troop were ashore, the leading craft drifted off the bank, probably because the coxswain had been wounded, but the captain, Jeremy Moore, immediately took the wheel and brought her into the bank again about 300 yards upstream. Here, a second landing was made, with the remainder of the marines that were on board the boat and who were designated the reserve section, disembarking and heading northwards to rejoin the rest of five troop in the vicinity of the police station. Leading this advance was Troop Sergeant Walter McFarlane, who led the reserve section forward to an area just north of the hospital where an insurgent ambush temporarily halted the advance. Tragically, during the firefight that developed, Sergeant McFarlane, along with Marines Ronald Formoy and Richard Jennings, were all killed in action. In addition, a fourth Marine suffered wounds during this engagement, which eventually saw the rebels being defeated and driven back into the adjacent woodland. Following the clearance of the hospital area, a detachment of the reserve section, under the command of Sergeant David Smith, moved in and secured the hospital itself, during which they found and freed nine of the hostages. At around the same time, a link was made with the rest of five troop near the police station, where they were also joined by the arrival of four and six troops from the second landing craft. The time was now approximately 0700, and with the whole of L Company ashore and a small beachhead established, Captain Jeremy Moore, the company commanding officer, turned his attention to securing Limbang Town to the north. The Royal Marine After Action Report details these operations. Six troop cleared the police station and four troop moved up behind and north of it, past the mosque, to the back of the town where one of the rebels gave them some difficulty by engaging them from a room full of women and children. However, he was dislodged and four troop entered the blocker shops. While six troop held the northern end of the beachhead and gave support, four troop cleared the first east-west block of shops in the bazaar area, and then six troop cleared the first south-north block supported by four troop. As soon as the first block of shops in the town had been cleared, four troop took over the northern end of the beachhead and six troop was transferred to the eastern side, whilst the support company elements cleared to the southern end of the town and released the remainder of the hostages. Whilst these operations were developing, five troop, who were holding the southern sector of the beachhead, moved on and secured a handful of buildings, during which a civilian, who was inside one of the houses, was unfortunately killed when they were caught up in the crossfire. By afternoon on the 12th of December 1962, L Company had a firm foothold in the southern portion of Limbang and had freed a total of 14 hostages. Early the next morning, elements of the company swept through and cleared the remainder of the town, after which reinforcements in the form of K Company and the headquarters of 4-2 Commando arrived in the area to strengthen the beachhead. The arrival of these troops effectively marked the end of the Royal Marines' mission into Limbang, as the remnants of the rebel force fled into the nearby jungles. For L Company, the operation proved to be both decisive and costly. On the one hand, 89 Marines had conducted an amphibious assault against a 300-man strong rebel garrison, and not only had they retaken Limbang, but they had freed all the hostages. However, on the other hand, it had come at a price. L Company has suffered five men killed in action, and a further eight wounded. Reflecting on the operation, Corporal David Greenhow recalls, In terms of our own casualties, we had five dead and quite a number of injuries. That is high. 
In later attacks or major battles, my whole unit never encountered five fatalities, so this was heavy casualties for us. I felt no feeling of elation on passing a dead enemy or an injured enemy. Rather, I thought of the utter waste of it. Obviously, I felt great sympathy for personal colleagues, who I knew had been injured or killed. 